Got it. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the Northwest Geriatric Education Center's Geriatric Health Lecture Series. Um, as usual, my name is Barb Cochran, and I'm the director of the Deterney Center here in the School of Nursing, and I'm representing the Northwest GEC today, which is putting on this lecture series, as well as we will be doing a lecture series in spring um, of this year. So stay tuned for that. Today, we're very lucky to have Cindy Sayre come and talk with us about fall prevention from a nursing perspective. Um, Cindy has studied fall prevention in the hospital since 2003. She has developed fall prevention programs, including policies and procedures. She's lectured at the state and local levels on the subject, and she currently serves as the executive sponsor of the Fall Prevention Initiative. So welcome, Cindy. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to be able to be with you this afternoon and just share a little bit of the work that I've done um, in fall prevention and some of what the current understanding uh, around the science of fall prevention is. I think uh, we have to say that this is a very personal subject for many of us, um, and I'll get there in just a minute, but there are some people that are famous that have fallen, right? So we have some pictures here of some of famous fallers. Uh, that's Dr. Adkins um, up there on the left-hand side. Uh, and remember, he was the one who advocated for a low-carb diet and unfortunately slipped on an icy sidewalk and developed a sub subdural hematoma. So it's just kind of let's just keep that in mind because that's what happens to our patients sometimes. Uh, that's Kurt Vonnegut down there in the middle. Uh, Miss Universe, who uh, I think stumbled on her way during one of the portions of the beauty contest. And then Barbara Walters also slipped on pavement and um, had a head injury as it related to that. And here's a not so famous faller, uh, Cindy Sayer. So I have fallen several times. One time I was here at the medical center and I was trying to go get some supplies to teach a class and also at the same time admiring the shoes that I had on thinking what a great deal they had been and missed a step and kind of uh, fell down several steps and that resulted in um, a fracture of my forearm and a lot of disability for me as related to that. For example, not being able to get dressed, uh, not being able to write since it was my left arm that was broken and I'm left-handed. So I, I think that most of us have some experience with falling. I can tell you it was interesting back, I'd say, maybe 2005 when we had just started our fall work together at University of Washington Medical Center. We had the chance to have the Joint Commission come out and talk to us about our performance, and not just for falls, but they did a, a complete survey of the medical center. And we're showing them our data, and some of it we're not super proud of because this is really a difficult problem to work on. And what I did as the leader of that session is I said, I'd like you just to raise your hand if you have fallen in the last year. This included the surveyors and the staff that were sitting around the table. And I can tell you the majority of hands went up. So you can, in whatever setting you're in right now, raise your hand if you've fallen in the last year. I'm sad to say I'd have to raise mine because even in December I was on a walk with my um, husband and my ankle turned and I fell. Why do I even start like this? Because it sounds kind of doom and gloom from the beginning. Uh, it's just to normalize this a little bit because I think there is such an intense focus on fall prevention in hospitals and in community settings, and rightfully so. But we forget that falls are, are so common, and even for people who are healthy and don't have other uh, challenges, we do have a tendency to fall, some of us. On a kind of more personal note as well, I can tell you that in uh, 2004, I was uh, lucky enough to have my mom come out um, and live with me for a while. She was uh, not able to care for herself at home, but still getting around pretty well and able to socialize. And one day, um, she was calling her insurance company, this is a little bit ironic, in trying to get her insurance card and do it quickly. She stumbled over the phone cord. Uh, and fractured her femur. Now, I was here at the medical center getting ready to do a fall prevention work group when I got the message from my husband, and I can hear my mother in the background saying, you know, George, I can't straighten out my leg. What does this mean? To which I said, 
I need to call 911. She did um, have a fractured femur and interestingly, you know, went on to have the surgery, but being 77 years old, the comorbidities that go along with that, including uh, she had a, a myocardial infarction while she was in the medical center. And certainly by the time she was discharged, uh, was one level of functioning below her baseline that she had started at. So this is common uh, among people who fall, especially when they're elderly. I'm also just going to say that uh, I'm going to talk about falls in the hospital and somewhat in the community, older people and younger people. We know that older patients are at higher risk of falling, and I'll give you some of those data points shortly. But when we're talking about patients that are hospitalized or in any kind of care setting, whether it's a skilled nursing facility or an adult family home, they also have increased risk. So this is the definition that's being used right now. The first one is um, from the National Database of Nursing Quality Indicators. And this is the one we use at University of Washington Medical Center. It's a sudden, unintentional descent with or without injury to the patient. And it results in the patient coming to rest on the floor or on or against some other surface, on another person, we've seen that in the medical center, or on some object. So you can see you don't have to go all the way down to the ground to have it classified as a fall. It's this unintentional descent. And we ask ourselves questions about that, like, well, what if it's a psych patient? And uh, we've had some where the nurse has reported that she felt like the patient was trying to get attention and kind of came up to the front desk and fell. Uh, in our last meetings with UW Medicine uh, staff from across our whole system, we've all agreed that we're going to count those falls in our total definition because we can't be sure. We really don't know was this person thinking, I'm going to fall down, or were they thinking, I'm just going to raise my voice. We really can't tell. So we don't screen them out from the get-go. CMS has classified fall-related injury as a never event, and this is one of the many adverse Things that can happen to you in a hospital that CMS is now saying, we're not going to pay for this. And in their definition, they say that in, they define this fall as an injury received when a person descends abruptly due to the force of gravity and strikes the surface at the same, I should say, or lower level. So that's interesting, right? The force of gravity, now to, in my mind, that might not mean a trip because it's not Maybe that wasn't just gravity that pulled them down. Maybe that was a impedance. Um, CMS makes those determinations by looking at chart reviews. And when a, when a fall is coded, they go in and look to see what was the injury level. But also, if this definition really is looking at falls that caused injury, where the NDNQI definition looking at all falls. I should also say that in the NDNQI definition, they do have categories of injury. So this is their total fall definition, and then you can have a mild, moderate, or severe uh, type of injury. And a mild injury is anything that you have to provide treatment for. This includes Band-Aid, ice on a bruise. So this is important to realize, too. When you look at hospital fall statistics, you need to really realize a lot of the injury falls that we have in the medical center are very minor but we still count them as injuries. So I'm probably preaching a little bit to the choir, and that's why you're here listening to a fall prevention talk. But let's just say, why is this such a big problem? Well, it's thought that one out of three older adults, 65 or older, falls each year, but less than half of them talk to their health care providers about it. Now that's very interesting. So it tells me as a provider, if I'm interested in the health of my patients that are 65 years or older, I'm going to have to ask the distinct question, have you fallen in the last year? Because first of all, they don't really, they might not remember. And second of all, there might be embarrassment or they're afraid that it might result in um, some kind of change in their care situation if they do report it. So we need to be intentional about asking. Among older adults, falls are the leading cause of both fatal and non-fatal injuries. So they are the number one accident that happened to these patients that are people that are 65 years or older. 
and more than 662,000 of the patients were hospitalized. This was in, I believe, a year's worth of time. This is what came out of the 2010 data that I found on the CDC website. The citation is kind of small on the bottom there. But in 2010, the direct medical cost of falls adjusted for inflation was $30 billion. So that is, that's sobering in and of itself when you think about how precious our healthcare dollars really are. What is this related to? Well, what kinds of imaging do these patients need for follow-up? What kind of physician or nursing care do they need in follow-up? We know that this can increase the length of stay for patients if they do fall while they're in the medical center. And as CMS has told us in the last slide, this is unreimbursed care. This is a burden now on the medical center, whoever's providing the care. By the way, I'll also say fall prevention is interesting to study because we see statistics that are widely variable. So I saw one other um, statistic where they said, well, in 2020, we're expecting the cost of falls to go above $100 billion. So I'm giving you what the CDC is saying was the most recent date. I think it's from 2010. But we know that healthcare costs are rising, that the population is aging in general, so we can do the math and think, yes, this is going to become even more of a significant burden as we go forward. About 50% of the patients that require hospitalization for a fall will not return to independent living. And it's conventional wisdom. I don't know if I've ever seen this actually in print, but it's conventional wisdom that a patient that falls will lose one level of functionality. So, for example, if the person was walking unassisted at the time of the fall, they'll go on to need either a walker or cane, some kind of assistive device. And similarly, if they were using an assistive device, they may have to go to a wheelchair. So very, very serious sequela uh, from a fall. I thought this was interesting. Men are more likely than women to die from the fall. The fall death rate in 2010 was 40% higher for men than for women. But guess who falls more? Women. So women have more falls. But when the men do fall, uh, they have more fatality, higher rate of fatality. And this is from the literature, up to 30% of all falls result in moderate to severe injury. So this is not the bruise and cut category, but this is the more moderate to severe. What do we mean by that? It could be stitches, it could be a fracture, all the way to um, thinking back to Dr. Adkins' case where he hit his head on the pavement, sustained a subdural hematoma, and um, ended up having a fatality from that. That just doesn't happen only on the outpatient side. We have had instances where patients have um, sustained a very serious head injury in the medical center that they have not been able to recover from. So that's, this is why we're all kind of here this evening to talk about it, to think what are some other strategies that we can use, uh, because it is a really serious issue. So one, one more piece of data about uh, the rate of falls. And we do, like I said, use the National Database for Nursing Quality Indicators, NDNQI. When I looked at their fall rate, their mean total fall rate across all the medical centers, this is the benchmark at the 50th percentile, uh, 2.82 per 1,000 patient days, which is really hard to think about that number. Because when you put anything in a ratio like that, you lose the individuals that are falling. So I just mentioned that for people who wanted more statistics, but I think more importantly, you can think about the 65-year-old gentleman that fell and sustained an injury, the 45-year-old woman who sustained an injury. Really important that we keep the, these patients humanized so that we um, understand the problem fully. The mean fall with injury rate is about 0.55 per 1,000 patient days. And that 1,000 patient days is just a way to normalize the data so that uh, if we have a higher census or lower census, the rate will stay somewhat constant. So this is a question that I've asked myself. I went back to um, get my PhD. I started the program in 2011 here at University of Washington School of Nursing. And one of the first things I thought about uh, studying was how did falls end up being a nursing-sensitive quality indicator? Because 
in our medical center, we really think of this as being a multidisciplinary issue. You think about all the people that touch the patient during the day, and somehow it's kind of the nursing care that gets charged with the fall, and it's a reflection on the nursing care. So um, the NDNQI says nurses are responsible for identifying patients who are at risk for falls. Okay, I agree. We, we should be identifying them. That's a great nursing job. And for developing a plan of care to minimize that risk, and that's true. We should be doing that. Short staffing, nursing experience, inadequate nurse knowledge, and here's the one that gets me, and the immature state of the science regarding fall prevention may place patients at risk for injury. I really think there's a lot of meaning in that last sentence about the immature state of the science. And so that's why it makes it difficult to pin it all on the nurses, because there's so much we don't know. The other big piece here, um, and another piece that I've studied in my graduate work, is really the role of autonomy. So you have a nurse that can assess the patient and say, yeah, this person is at high risk for falls. Therefore, I'm going to put the following plans in place. But we still have a human being with free will in the bed who, well, can do what? Well, they can turn the bed alarm off, which I'm thinking might be a criteria for discharge if you can come up with that plan and actually do it. Maybe it's time to go home. But we've had that. We've had patients take, turn off their bed alarm. We've had patients where they're not confused um, and they understand that, that the nurse wants them to call if they need assistance, and they still make the decision to get up on their own and go. So I, I just bring these up as this is just part of this confounding picture. It's like, darn it, we have an immature science around fall prevention because it is so multifactorial. And then we have this piece about patient autonomy where you know they can kind of thwart even our best efforts um, at times. Also of interest to me was the average cost of an accidental fall is $17,500. Here's the length of stay piece. I thought I had it in here. Patients who fall have an increased length of stay that ranges between 6.3 and 12 days. Well, our average length of stay at UW hovers around 6.9. So this is significant. That's almost a, close to a doubling of the length of stay. And as I told you, not reimbursed. We also know that there's a lot of uh, hospital liability um, that come with falls. And I have personally read many of, of these cases where um, the patient is left unattended for a split second. As a matter of fact, the one that, I, one that I saw last week, this was not in our medical center, so I'm not breaking my own rules here, but a patient was uh, toileted with a assisted personnel, I think a nursing aide, and she had the patient up on the commode. She turned her back to the patient to, because somebody was calling her from the doorway, and the patient fell you know, flat on their face. And now that patient um, and the family are suing the hospital. This is a really common occurrence, because you have a patient who's either sitting up on the commode or on the toilet. And we'll talk about the tremendous impact of toileting on falls. It's very significant. Um, and you have that you just turn for a split second to do what? Well, to grab a washcloth, to get some supply that you, you know, forgot quickly. And it just takes that split second of inattention by the healthcare personnel, and the patient can sustain a serious injury. So this is another uh, scenario we've seen. This one, this is a stroke rehab patient, not my hospital. I would have my own to share, by the way. So I'm, <laughs> I'm a fellow learner with you, but I'm just saying this one wasn't ours. Uh, a stroke rehab patient fell off a commode after reaching for the toilet paper. We try to tell them that they don't need to pick anything up off the floor, but we see that's pretty common that they try to. Despite being instructed to wait for help, um, she ended up in a cast for a month and then developed foot drop, and there was a $178,000 judgment against the hospital. So this idea about I told them not to, not to uh, get up without assistance, and I in my position in the medical center, I read every incident report related to falls, as do some of my colleagues who are sitting in the room with me. And if I had a dime for every one of them where the nurse says, I told them not to get up without assistance, they demonstrated the use of the call light, they raised their right hand, they promised me they wouldn't get it without help, you know, they weren't confused, they've been calling for help appropriately all day, so 
I thought that they understood, and then boom, the patient's up and falling. Really, is patient education is critical, and it's not enough. So both of those things are true. We have to be talking to patients and families. We had a focus group uh, several years ago where, after we had a very serious uh, actual fatal fall in one of our units, and we we realized that the nurses, they would say, you know, I don't want you to get up because I don't want you to fall. They'd be saying, Cindy, you know, I want you to use your call light, don't get up. But they didn't tell me what could happen if I did fall. They And so the patients were thinking, well, the worst that could happen to me is I'll break a bone, I'll break my arm, or I'll break my leg, and that's a risk I'm going to take because I really have to go to the bathroom. When in reality, for many of these patients, it is a true risk that they could suffer a fatality if they fall. And we'll talk about some of the risk factors for that. So we talked to this patient focus group about, do you want to know this patient? Would it work if I told you, if you get up without assistance, we actually have had people that have died from doing that here. I want you to know the risk. We think about this as informed refusal. So all of us are, you know, current with the concept of informed consent. But what does it mean for a patient if they get up without assistance or do something that you've asked them not to do, disable. And again, I'm, I'm talking about patients that are um, alert and oriented. Confused patients are a completely different category. But the ones that are alert and oriented, some of them choose, right? They choose not to follow one of the policies that we've put in place for their safety. So what we t we've talked about UWMC is, okay, let's make sure this process of informed refusal, I need to tell you in reality what can happen if you sustain a fall. Our patients were very supportive of that. At the same meeting, I asked them, we also were thinking about using helmets at that point for to prevent head injury. And I showed them, and the company that made them, you know, a nice kind of mom and pop company that had very beautiful, maybe some of you are using them. So I brought what I thought was a great idea to this uh, focus group saying, hey, look at this helmet, and what if I told you you were at really high risk for falling and hitting your head? And they basically said, do not put that on me. <laughs> they would they would have rejected this particular helmet. So I think that's another kind of story about how can we engage the patients that we're serving um, to find out what is acceptable to them. Maybe they'll wear a hip protector, but the helmet, they thought it looked like a toaster cover, which it kind of did. But um, so, you know, we have to engage our uh, patients in this whole thing. So we know that our joint commission imperative and just doing the right thing, our organizations, no matter what type of care you're providing or what setting, you need to demonstrate that you have a fall prevention program that's organized and current. I can tell you, as we were working on all of these things here at the medical center, some of our outpatient areas um, started having problems with falls. Why is that? Well, because patients that would have been hospitalized 10 years ago are now in the outpatient setting. They're seeing a lot of very sick and unstable patients, and they, they needed to come up with their own fall prevention program that was completely different from what it looked like in the inpatient side. I'm just quickly going to say what the Joint Commission requires us to do, because I think it is a nice uh, review of this overarching strategy that we need to have in preventing falls. Well, the first thing we need to do is, it's like a 12-step program. We have to admit that we have a problem. And when we do that, we're going to establish a fall prevention program. And, it, and again, for some settings where you're thinking, well, do I really need one? I'm in a clinic setting or I'm in a procedural setting. Do I really need a fall prevention program? My experience would say, yes, you do. Because whether the patient is having a colonoscopy, we've seen them fall there, we've seen them fall um, after various procedures, at getting x-rays, even when they don't seem to have any risk factors, sometimes they can fall getting off the table and the x-ray. So it's just good to think about, take a look at your environment and think, what are the risks of falls here? And what do we need to do to keep these patients or the people that we serve as safe as possible? And I just said, it includes evaluation specific to the patient population, the settings and the service. And then we have to figure out how are we going to intervene. Well, this became a very interesting discussion in the outpatient world, which I think many of you are, are working in ambulatory care settings. So, for example, you have a patient who's in the waiting area, and you can just tell from across the room that person's a risk to fall. How do I know? Well, they're over 65. They didn't look that steady when they walked in to the receptionist. They just look like a fall risk. 
what are you going to do for them to keep them from falling? Does that mean you have to go out to the waiting room with the gate belt or a wheelchair and escort them back into the room? You know, perhaps. What about when they say to you, I don't need this help. I'm fine. I'm getting around at home. What will we say then if this is part of our fall prevention program? So as you kind of get, get into the granular details of your setting, then you can start to see some of these challenges. How do we design a reliable um, fall prevention program that our patients find acceptable? The Joint Commission also tells us, yeah, you need to educate your staff. It's great that you know this, but what about all of your staff? And I'm thinking again about the ambulatory setting. Those receptionists or um, patient service specialists or whatever they're called at your organization, they play a key role because the nursing staff might not see that patient's gait when they come in or might not kind of pick up on some of these issues. Uh, so we all need to work together as a team. We need to educate patients and families, and I just kind of talked to you about that. But let's talk a little bit more about the families. Now, some of the work that they're doing, we're doing at the medical center, and Joni Harrington's in the room with me right now, a fall prevention specialist at UWMC, working on contracts for patients and families to say, here's what we'll do, and here's what we would like you to do. So there's been some success at other organizations with using this kind of contract type of language. And in terms of the family, this is a little tricky because we want to educate the family and we don't want to rely on them. So we have seen in our uh, medical center, the patient will be, a the family will be in the room with the patient and so everyone thinks, okay, this patient's been attended to. But either the patient tries to get up without assistance and the family member doesn't know how to help them or in some cases can actually be injured by the patient falling on them or they leave the room and they don't, uh, we didn't realize the bed alarm was off, that the floor mat was moved, that some of those environmental safety structures were changed. So we just want to make sure that, you know, the families in the room are not really the whole answer. We have to make sure we have open communication with them and let them know that if you're going to be leaving the room, you know, these are the three things I'd like you to do before you go. With the last one being, let me know that you've stepped out. Then the last part is that we need to evaluate our programs for effectiveness. So if your area, wherever you're working, if you're not collecting falls data, um, that must feel great because it means you probably don't have that many. But you do want to start making notation of them so that you can watch for the trends. We've already talked about a little bit of this, but um, you know, we've, I've been personally working on this for you know over 10 years. And if you would have told me 10 years ago that we would be still kind of fighting some of the same battles now that we were then, it would have been super discouraging. <laughs> so why, why is this so hard? And why do many medical centers have a difficult time um, getting their fall rates down? And I, I will say, I don't, my personal belief is that zero is not really a realistic goal. Getting to zero, I mean, we see it sometimes in webinars, like how they got to zero, like wow. Getting to zero is, um, I don't think it's a real, realistic goal for the types of patients that we care for. Uh, because some of the falls are assisted by physical therapy, and these are patients that are just lowered to the ground. So this is why I don't think zero is necessarily realistic. But definitely, getting those numbers down to ones and twos you know, over time is, is doable, and it's really important. Why is this getting harder? It's because our patients are getting older, as am I, and as are you. We're all, the whole population is aging, and we know there's a correlation between aging and falls. There's this rising patient acuity and dynamic changes in condition, and I mentioned that in, related, in relation to these acute patients that were seen on the outpatient side that used to be on the inpatient side, but let's just talk about the ones that are on a med surge unit right now that would have clearly been in an ICU. I looked at one of the falls that our medical center had this week, and when I read the profile of the patient, I was shocked that this patient wasn't in the ICU. But you know, truly, these have now become med surge patients. Well, the nursing ratio on a med surge in one of our med surge units, it's one nurse taking care you know, of three to five patients, depends on the shift. So you increase the acuity and you keep the staffing level you know, somewhat constant, and then we have a gap in our safety. 
which relates to the next one, nurse shortages. We know that um, for whatever reason, it, it's uh, not unusual for our units to, be, to run short staff. Some of it is just sick calls, leaves. And then we don't have great work environments for our nurses on the inpatient side in terms of letting them stay in proximity to their patients. So these units were designed, at least the ones in our medical center, in a big triangle. And for you to get, you know, to, from the supply room to the patient is a great distance. And add that to the fact that primary care nursing isn't always compatible with geographic co-location. So that I, you know, as a nurse, and when I was doing bedside care, I always wanted my patients back the next day. You know those patients. But we didn't really make a huge effort to group them in the same hallway. So that means if a bed alarm goes off, I might not be nearby to hear it. You know, we need to think about these environments that we're setting up, get the supplies closer to the patient so that the nurses can stay close to the patient. That's where the safety is. I already kind of gave you my whole spiel about patient autonomy. Uh, it is just really interesting to think about. I will say something about that for our younger patients uh, here that are hospitalized. One of the other ways I like to think about it is, what would that patient be doing if they didn't have this medical illness. They'd be maybe working full time, they'd be you know, chasing small children around, they'd be uh, co contributing to their community in some way. These are people who really see themselves and they are you know, vibrant, active people. And then you give them some acute change in their health care status and it's very difficult to adapt to say, oh, I really do need help. I'll give you one example and it's a Cindy Sayer. This is a Cindy Sayer non-famous non-fall event. So I had um, bunion surgery about a year ago, a little over a year ago. And uh, they got me up to the commode and they left the room. And I, that was okay, I was stable on the commode. But they left me for longer than, I, it felt like an hour to me, it was probably 10 minutes. But I was thinking, okay, maybe I can get back to bed on my own. And here I had one foot, I, I was non-weight bearing on this foot. And no, you know, no real assistive things around me. So as I'm sitting there, I had enough, you know, cognition to kind of review a lots of fall events that I've read in my career with this exact scenario. Patient thought she could make it. You know, she thought she didn't need the help. So I just sat there and I didn't fall. But it took a lot, that took a lot of my own knowledge about the risk to keep me seated there. Because the drive is to get back to bed or to get to the commode. And this, uh, we'll talk more about it with toileting, but that was just my kind of patient autonomy. I had to manage my own autonomy uh, for safety, and that's not always easy to do. Okay, this thought that falls really are a re result of this perfect storm between a risk in the individual or an intrinsic risk and an extrinsic risk or a risk in the environment. And that's, I mean, right. We know that these risks, as we talk about them, are cumulative in their effects, so that if you have three risk factors, you're more likely to fall than if you just have one. And let's talk about what some of those are. There's these intrinsic risk factors, and I will do you the favor of not reading all of them, but just to talk about some of the big ones, we, we know kind of about gait and balance impairment. That seems pretty obvious. If I'm stumbling around, um, I'm more likely to fall. But we also need to think about just this peripheral neuropathy, which we can't always, we don't always know about it. Where do we see that? Patients with long-standing type 1 or type 2 diabetes that have, you know, a burning or a numbness in their feet or poor proprioception. We see this in some of our chemotherapy patients as a result of the chemotherapy drugs. So thinking about neuropathy and, you know, how carefully are we assessing for that? The other one I'll mention, what well, we're going to talk about in a few minutes, is dementia. And um, again, two scholars in the room here have looked at the relationship between dementia and the signs of dementia and then fall risk. And I can tell you, you know, my, my mother, my, when she was 77 and had recovering from the fractured femur, she did have dementia. But the um, pattern on the wallpaper was talking to her at some point. So I think this is a very big issue, especially in certain care settings and certainly uh, in the inpatient setting. And then there's extrinsic risk factors, and we'll talk more about those, but you can think about what those are, like 
Um, do, do I have a clear path to the bathroom, for example? Am I tethered? We had a long discussion the other day in our fall work group about being tethered and what does that mean to your SCDs, to your um, IVs, and, and what all can be untethered. And, but then there's a precipitating cause. So if I'm in my bed and I'm dizzy or I have poor gait, that, I'm not going to fall. There's got to be some kind of precipitating uh, cause. And that's where these trips and slips are. These drop attacks or syncopal episodes, I kind of think of those together where people just go down. And we see this sometimes on our ortho floor. Um, the patient will get up with the nurse, and usually they have a gait belt on the patient, which is good because often these patients just, they'll say, my knees buckled. That's what they report when we said what happened. They just go down. There's no warning. It'd be nice if they said, I'm going down in five, four, three, but they don't, they don't count down. They just go. Um, and then dizziness that results in a fall. Moving now to the outpatient setting, there was a study done where they looked at what was significant predictors of falls for ambulatory care patients. And when they asked the patient, um, have you fallen in the last year, the odds ratio of that patient going on to fall later was 2.3 to 2.8. And then the second significant question was, do you have a gait or a balance problem? So I know we added those to our screens on the ambulatory side, just those two really simple questions. Have you fallen, and do you have a gait or balance problem? And then I skipped over this first bullet, but this is uh, just another piece of data, maybe not quite consistent with some of the other data that I've seen, but again, these, t these tend to vary. But the likelihood of any 65-year-old falling in a year is about 27%. Um, with that 95% confidence interval between 19 and 36. So I'm um, kind of moving back now to this kind of fall risk factors in the individual or intrinsic risk factors. Well, the previous history of falling makes sense, but also it's been found that a fear of falling increases the risk of falling. So that's really interesting to think about, because in some ways I would think, well, if you're afraid to fall, maybe you'll be more careful and you won't you won't uh, get up on your own. But I think there's something to do here with deconditioning. I have a fear of falling. I'm limiting my own mobility because I'm afraid of that. I stay at home or whatever. And then by this deconditioning, I'm increasing my risk for falls. But certainly, um, a fear of falling is a significant factor. Altered elimination. We'll be talking about toileting throughout this um, talk. And I'll tell you that on some of our units, and this is coming up a little later, We've seen up to 70% of the falls on certain med surge units related to toileting. So this is also really interesting to me. It turns out that toileting is a very complex activity. So going from, you know, understanding I have the urge to, to uh, use the toilet, getting to somewhere that I want to use the toilet, <laughs> like a commode or a toilet, and then back into bed, and then the, kind of the hygiene that goes with that, there's just so many places in there where patients are, are at risk for falling. Uh, I will also tell you, in my experience, this need to get to the bathroom or the commode is a very primal need that people have. I think it's something that's instilled in us when we're teeny tiny. Some people have had shame attached to that as well as they were potty training. And to tell a patient, and I still read this sometimes, um, usually in patients that are complaining about something, they'll say, the nurse told me just to go in the bed. So if there's any nurses out there that tell patients, just go, I don't mind, we'll clean it up later, they won't. You know, they won't because this is a very primal thing to, to use the bathroom for our patients. Uh, we talked about the balance and the weakness. Let's just talk about confusion and impulsive impulsivity and poor judgment. So this is interesting because it is really dynamic. And I think I said this earlier. One of the things I see in these fall reports is, hey, this patient had been using their call light appropriately all day. And they do until maybe 6.30 p.m., 7 o'clock, whenever that kind of sundowning phenomenon you know, starts to come. Patients become more confused. They're not in their regular environment. So confusion is not a static state or alertness for a lot of our patients. Not a static state. This is very dynamic. And this is why things like hourly rounding can be really helpful because you can be assessing your patient. And I think I've had this experience as a nurse. 
you've, you know, you go and talk to a patient, everything seems fine. And then the next hour you're in there and they say something bizarre to you, right? And you're like, okay, it's a flag. We've had a change. Now I can alter my plan because now there might be some confusion. Sensory or visual ear impairments, hemodynamic instability. Okay, I'll just make one plug about this. Let's talk about that orthostatic uh, patient. Here's another thing I've seen that I just hope I never see again. So the patient has a orthostatic vital signs ordered. The nurse does it in the, in the supine position, sits the patient up. Sure enough, there's a drop in blood pressure with them sitting. And what do they do? Stand the patient up. So I can tell you if there was a drop between lying down and sitting up, we could pretty much predict there will be another one when they stand. Only this time, they are going to fall. And I've actually seen it where, you know, the nurse, and then I was just reaching for the blood pressure cuff, but you have this patient that you're testing for orthostasis. So I would say, you know, you can report that as a finding that the patient fell from supplying to sitting, and that's as far as you're going to go. You're going to lie them back down. You can challenge me on that later during the questions if you want. Um, depression turns out to be a risk factor, and that's really interesting. Why is that? Well, you know, when we're depressed, there's a lot of inward thinking, right? We're thinking a lot about ourselves and, and just how bad things are, and we're maybe not focusing our attention on environmental hazards, um, on following some of the safety rules. So depression uh, did turn out to be a risk factor in several studies. Now, benzodiazepines also, and I will just throw in this category Ambien, although it's probably not a true benzodiazepine, but these things that tend to alter our CNS and we, we, um, we've seen falls where the nurse gives the patient the Ambien and then the patient gets into the bathroom to do their evening hygiene. So one of the things that we've talked about at our medical center is if you do need to give somebody Ambien, you, that's the last thing that happens before they go to sleep. So the hygiene's done, teeth are brushed, face is washed, whatever, everyone's in their bed, tucked in, then they can have the Ambien. I mean, there's some question about the use of Ambien in the inpatient setting at all because it, it has, it can have like delirium-like effects on people and which can increase the risk of falls. But we know these, these medications are, increase the risk. So it's back to that earlier point about this is just not a static situation. Maybe I've only used Ativan once today and the risk period around that Ativan might be four to six hours after the dose. So other than that, the patient's been okay. But for this time, I need to increase my surveillance of the patient. So understanding the impact of some of those medications. The epidural, I think we can all think about that, and the motor impacts of the epidural. This was a study that was done um, several years ago that looked at relative risk. It was a uh, um, looked across studies, 16 studies, meta-analysis is the word. And this is what, what came out of this particular study. Looking at weakness, and this is actually where I'm going to focus my attention for my, my doctoral dissertation, because I started thinking about the fact that for weakness, we don't really use an objective measure of strength in the medical center. It's all subjective. Like, yeah, I think you're okay to mobilize by yourself, or even a physical therapist doing a straight leg raise. There's some subjectivity in that. So I'm interested in, in kind of how we might use grip strength as a proxy for overall strength. Uh, and I'm looking at oncology patients. But weakness is, a, of course, a big factor. We talked about the prior fall, balance, gait deficit, the assistive device, and that's, you know, that's a proxy for, I think, weakness and balance. Arthritis, and then any kind of ADL deficit. What's not, what didn't make it onto this list, so again, I don't know what to think about it, but I don't see confusion on here, or impulsivity. Now, in our, my experience, especially impulsivity, because you can be confused and pretty content to stay in your bed, you're going to be fine. But this impulsivity of, you know, throwing their legs over the side and, and all of that is where we get into trouble. This is uh, just a little bit of data about the delirium from uh, one of the sources that I, I read. Um, thought to be a risk factor, it's a greater risk factor in the hospital than it is uh, in like a residential care, but up to 10% of the falls related to delirium in the residential care setting, up to 45% of the falls related to, de to delirium in the inpatient setting. And, you know, we know some of the very concrete strategies about delirium in terms of sleep-wake cycle and how we can normalize environments for patients, 
making sure that they um, have their their glasses and their hearing aids so that they can interpret their environment correctly, you know, cutting down on some of those medications that we know put them at risk for delirium. So it's not all about the patient and what's going wrong with them. Some of it is about how we're managing their environment. And uh, this becomes really challenging. So clutter, you know, some of these patients that have been here a long time and I can imagine in a long-term care facility, um, you just get a lot of clutter. People have a lot of stuff and they like their stuff near them, which is fine. Uh, but we have to just make sure that these paths stay clear. One of the things we've seen in the literature is people at home slipping on magazines. So you get these newspapers and magazines kind of strewn around the floor. Those are really slick. So thinking about kind of picking up some of that clutter. Poor lighting is a factor. Wheelchairs um, and beds not locked. We've seen many of many falls. You know, here we give you the wheelchair to help make you safe, only if I don't use the brakes, that's not going to work. Uh, another thing about that, too, that we learned was these, these wheelchairs really should have footrests on them if someone else is propelling it. So I see patients that come in with their own wheelchairs. There's a footrest missing or no footrest, and they have someone pushing them. And the, the hazard there is the wheel gets stuck or the foot gets stuck, and the patient can kind of catapult, and we've actually seen that happen with devastating uh, results. So if it's a person, I've seen this too, where they're in their wheelchair and they're kind of using their feet to, it's like the um, Flintstones to get their car going, then that's, that's okay because they're not going to, they won't propel themselves out generally, but the people who, if we tell our employees you cannot push a wheelchair without footrests, you have to have the feet on, on the footrest so that they don't get tangled up. Uh, we talked about uh, pajama bottoms, oh we haven't talked about that yet. So what are your, you know, what are your patients wearing in, in whatever setting that they're in that the clothes fit well? IV tubing and pulls, we talked about that. Okay. Uh, now, interesting. So people are 11 times more likely to fall if they're in bare feet or stocking feet. Here's another thing we talked about at our fall prevention group. How good are those slipper socks that get bunched, you know, around? Now, I think they've finally, in my 30-year nursing career, we now have double-sided grips, which we didn't have in the beginning. And generally, when it was just one side that, that had the grip surface, you could bet that was usually on the top of the foot. But, you know, they just, they're, they're not sized well, and they're, you know, I think that they can be um, a hazard. People do better in their own kind of footwear, and their appropriate footwear. So we've talked about, is that something that, and I guess some of our nursing units are doing this, where they're having their patients put on tennis shoes or at least, you know, some kind of, loafer, a regular shoe. And think about what patients are used to walking in, too. They're probably more accustomed to walking like that. But bare feet, even bare feet, um, not safe. And then, of course, if we have a cane or a walker that's not the right size, it's not good. I've seen that, too, with the, you know, the patients, the walkers. Okay. So we talked about the outpatient risk assessment. Let's just spend a little bit of time on how we're assessing the risk for falls in the inpatient and what does it mean. We want the, t the tools to at least be standardized if, if not validated. And it's very interesting how many places around the country have hybrid or, you know, scales and tools. And that really needs to be done with caution. So if you have, um, if you're using a modified, you know, Hendrick or something like that, that really needs to be studied because these tools were built, you know, using certain data sets, and you lose the validity of the tool if you alter one piece of it. And it's easy for us to say, well, this doesn't fit our patient. Okay, well, then let's prove it by using this tool and, and then looking for the sensitivity, specificity of the tool once we've made the adaptation to it. Um, at University of Washington Medical Center, we are using Johns Hopkins uh, tool. We have used the Hendrick II in the past. Um, and they're all in the literature, it'll say really not necessarily one tool better than another. It's about the consistent application of the tool. It's about the inner rate of reliability. Is everybody agreed on the definitions and is this being done like it should be? I will also say we're assessing our patients every 12 hours in the medical center and for the reasons that I described earlier because it is so dynamic, their change in condition that even 24 hours would be uh, a long time. One of the newer ideas, newer is all relative when you've been a nurse for 30 years, so this is probably a you know, four or five year old idea, 
was not just looking at the risk for falling, but what is the risk of injury for this patient if they do fall? Because if the risk is just a bruise, it might not be worth me taking your autonomy away and scaring the you know, heck out of you by saying all the things could happen. But if your risk of injury is really high, like a subdural hematoma or a fracture, then it might be worth a conversation. So what are things that put people at higher risk for injury? And we could probably, you could have thought of these yourself, but, you know, thrombocytopenia. We have patients, you know, they OS platelets. They're so low. They have like 5,000 platelets. So if they fall, they're going to bleed somewhere. Um, osteoporosis, and that was the situation with my mom. She had, you know, serious osteoporosis from years and years of smoking, part of it. And then we have our patients who are anticoagulated, where the INR is being kept therapeutically elevated for them. And again, if they fall, they're going to bleed and they're going to sustain injury. So we've been talking about, well, what do you do with that information then? Does that mean we stratify these patients where you stratify them first by their risk of fall and then maybe by their risk of injury? We haven't come up with a total answer. I'm asking you kind of more a rhetorical question, but thinking about if you only have X amount of resources to put toward a fall prevention program and you really feel this need to target um, certain patients, then you might need to think about how you're going to stratify. One of the ongoing discussions that we've had for 10 solid years here is, well, if we use this tool, everyone in this hospital is a fall risk. Yeah, probably really true. And it's true that if we make everybody a fall risk, kind of nobody's a fall risk because you just can't, you know, work at that level of surveillance for every single patient. So this is what I'm just offering. This is a really challenging tension between, you know, yeah, is everybody a fall risk or do we just need to kind of stratify one step further in terms of the uh, risk of injury so we know where to focus our attention. For the kind of real-time assessment, so those tools are really a fall screen, right? And they're population-based. When I I'm, I'm, say those tools, I'm talking about the Hendrick II, the Hopkins. They are the very first level, and those are population-specific. So those were done on, you know, we studied 2,000 patients, and we looked at all the falls, and some of the patients that fell had this or that or the other. They don't really tell me necessarily on this day how safe is it for me to mobilize this patient? And we need these real-time assessments because of the um, dynamic nature of the care that we're providing. So many years ago, we kind of came up with these three categories that we wanted to look at. We call them the three M's. We were very excited about this. And we gave out M&Ms to all the nurses. Was was one of our educational. It was an excuse to have M&Ms. But we talked about confusion, but mentation. Has there been a change in the mentation, or is this patient at risk because of their mentation? The confusion, the disorientation, and the depression. In the Hopkins tool, they would also say if you have somebody who is um, impulsive, they are automatically at high fall risk. You don't have to go any further. You're going to give every intervention to them. We talked about the medications that are at risk, or that put a patient at risk. Of interest, in the Hendricks tool, opioids fell, fell out as being a risk. They did not see an increased risk of falls with opioid. We find that interesting. Another study that we did at the U that we haven't published, sorry Liz Bridges if you're listening, was related to checking the fall, the medication profiles of the patients that fell and the patients that didn't fall because we keep seeing this data saying uh, opioids and benzos put you at higher risk. But we're like, well gosh, everybody in our medical center is on opioids or benzos, or, you know, something. So we compared the medication profiles. We did like two controls for every fall in the same, on the same unit with roughly the same diagnosis. And really there was no difference in medication profiles. So that might have been what Hendricks saw too when she studied that, yeah, it's, it is happening with patients that fall, but it's also happening in patients that don't fall, this opioid and benzo. So you do with that what you'd like to do. Uh, mobility, we need to know what your recent ability was and your fall history. And then we, we're going to assess three things in real time, your balance, your strength, and your ability to move. So um, can you do the gas pedal kind of move with your ankle? Because if you can't dorsiflex, you will not be able to take a successful step forward. Uh, and a straight leg raise without bending at the knee. And, th you know, these kind of came from another... Uh, I've said the word interesting a lot tonight. I don't know. Maybe I just find that interesting. 
But we had a very spirited discussion at the beginning of our work um, in about 2003 with uh, the physical therapist when we said, how should we be assessing these patients to see if they're safe to mobilize? And they, you know, basically handed us a paper that had 50 assessment points on it. And, you know, you're just kind of, because that's what they do, right? When those PTs go in the room, they do a very thorough assessment. And we came back to them and said, yeah, we're not going to do 50. Give us some give us a couple that might be meaningful to us in our real-time assessments. And this is what they came up with. So this ankle range of motion, the kind of gas pedal move, and a straight leg raise without bending the knee. If the patient cannot lift their leg against gravity uh, and keep the knee straight, a low likelihood that they'll be able to ambulate successfully. And then once we get them up, are they dizzy? You know, and then this trunk strength. I think many people who've been a nurse for a while, you've seen this listing. You know, you get them up to the sitting at the side of the bed and we have a listing because it's uh, uh, hard to hold your trunk up if you're very weak. And then a leg strength rising from the chair. What we had them do was kind of just push up on our, push their thigh up against our hand just to feel the resistance there. Once they're standing, then we're asking them about if they're dizzy. And then if one other uh, key assessment is to have them shift their weight in place because it's kind of simulate what they're going to have to do when they walk. Okay, so that's kind of the that's assessment piece. We talked about the outpatient. Have you had a fall? Do you have a gait imbalance? We talked about the full types of fall risk assessments and injury risk assessments we need to do for our patients that are hospitalized. So now let's just talk about some of the um, interventions. And these first ones, I think, are, are really related to the inpatient side. We do use bed alarms, and bed alarms are part of the bundle that's in many uh, places that have been found to be effective. Why? Now, when these first we first started talking about bed alarms, I said uh, they didn't make any sense to me because I thought, well, by the time the bed alarm goes off, the patient will have fallen. So it's not really. And it is important to think, bed alarm is not a fall reduction strategy, necessarily. I mean, it might be an injury reduction strategy, but it depends where the patient's going to fall. It turns out that they don't all just stand up and fall right away. Some of them make it several feet, in which case the bed alarm gives you time to get to the room. So then it's very effective. It's also good just to know if your patient has fallen, you kind of want to know that. So even if, it, even if they're on the ground when you respond to the bed alarm, that is a really critical piece of information that you need. I, tell, I told you about people disarming them because we, you know, patients don't like it. They roll over and bed and it goes off or they get up and, and they feel like they're being treated like children. So this is where this very important scripting comes in about their safety and their particular risk of falling. We use fall mats when these high-risk patients are unatt unattended. And we did see a significant decrease in our falls with injury when we put fall mats outside of every room. But they're, of course, not the be-all and end-all of fall prevention or injury. And this really wouldn't be fall prevention. This is injury reduction. Uh, you need to not have them down. If the patient is going to be ambulating in the room, either with or without you, that fall mat needs to go either under the bed or back outside because it will become a tripping hazard for sure. Um, and, they, we just, and then some of the staff would tell me, well, when I go in the room, I trip over the fall mat. I think, okay, well, don't do that because the fall mats are good for patients, but we need to use them appropriately. These are for patients who you do not want them up independently. You've said, please call me if you're going to get up. I don't want you to get up by yourself. Okay, I promise, nurse. Okay, patient, I promise I'm putting a fall mat down. These om we have omni belts, which are self-release kind of buckle belts that um, attach to the bed. They're self-release, and if the patient can demonstrate getting out of it, then it's not considered a restraint. If I put it on a confused patient, it would be considered a restraint. But what these do is they just slow people down. They slow people down so that you can maybe see somebody fumbling with it, you know, from the hallway and get in there to help them before there's a fall. That took one second. We have to have routine toileting, I'd say, every two hours for people who are confused. And not just, um, do you need to go to the bathroom? Because I'm super busy right now. I hope you say no. Not that. But saying, um, it's time to get up and use the bathroom. I have time right now. Let's go. Let's give it a try. Uh, every two to three hours, I told you toileting is the highest risk of falling, especially in the medical center. And then this is the part people don't like. If I get them to the toilet or the commode, I have to stay with them 
close enough to make a difference, as our physical therapist told me 10 years ago. You have to stay close enough to make a difference. It turns out there's nothing magical about your very presence in the room. I used to think when I was providing bedside care that, you know, I'm in the room. Of course, he's not going to fall. I'm right here. But we've seen just too many instances where, um, you, where the patient does indeed fall, even with a medical personnel in the room or a nursing personnel in the room. We don't want to use three side rails. Why? Because these confused and, imp and impulsive people try to go over the side that has the two up. Now, I would, you know, we put that up thinking there's only one way out. Maybe that prevents them from going this way and not. Side rails in general um, are, well, if there's four up, we know that's a restraint, so we can't really use that. And plus, there's a lot of strangulation risk and other problems with four side rails. So generally, the two side rails, and then they're used just as kind of a handhold, but not to keep someone in the bed. They don't really work that well for that. There's a picture of our fall mat. Um, I've also heard that called a landing strip. Yes, and so we keep one of those outside of um, all of our rooms, and, and then they're wiped down by um, environmental services when the patients leave. And they've been very, very helpful in reducing injury. Okay, what if I, my patient's confused? We talked about benzodiazepines. We're going to um, avoid them as much as possible, especially in our elderly patients, because they really um, cause a lot of confusion. We want to go ahead and schedule physical therapy for these patients. Make sure they're getting up appropriately with our, our therapists and keep them mobilized. We don't leave them unattended, bleh, unattended on the commode. And this takes very careful scripting because I don't know about you, but I personally don't want to try to use a commode or a bathroom with you staring at me. So we talk about this in our medical center about, well, you know, you just have to kind of turn your head and you know, kind of be close enough and watch their feet. So if you start to see some movement going on, I just turned away from the camera. But Okay. Um, and then gate belts. Now, gate belts, you know, 10 years ago when we started, they were really using them only on rehab. And now we've, we realize these gate belts save patient injury, but they also save staff injury. Because what is your, if you're a staff member and you're mobilizing a patient and they start to fall, what is your instinct? You, you want to try to catch them. You're grabbing their arm, you're grabbing their clothes or something, and they're taking you with them because they are already on the way down. Whereas if you have the gate belt and hands, nothing magical about the gate belt. It's kind of just like uh, everything else. But if you have your hands on the gate belt while you're mobilizing them, you can pull them towards yourself and lower them down uh, without injury, and you save the injury. And we've had a lot... We've had an increase, I think, in the assisted, we call it assisted falls, where someone's had hands on the gate belt. And it's very rare to see an injury with an assisted fall. We do every once in a while see it. But generally, people are able to slow that descent down, um, protect the head. What do I do if they're depressed? Well, we want to just think about the fact that they're not, their attention is not focused outward. Their attention is focused inward. So this is really about this environment, keeping things a, a clear path giving very clear instructions to patients before you mobilize them. Uh, we also talked 10 years ago about, what about these patients who are like, I got to go right now, right? So you're trying to get the room safe for the patient. So a couple of things. Uh, we talked to our staff about never sit the patient up at the side of the bed until you are completely ready. You have everything you need to mobilize them. The edge of the bed is a very dangerous place for patients because there is nothing to stop their fall. They go head first down, um, and very, very dangerous. Same with the commode. So when I'm the nurse, if I'm thinking I, I need to get my patient up to the bathroom, I need to get it all together before I sit them up at the edge of the bed. Let's say I sit someone up and I say, oh, I forgot my gate belt or I forgot something. They got to lay back down, and then I need to go get my things. It's the same thing with... Um, if you have a patient that's had some kind of soiling accident or urine accident, you know, you come in the room and there's just poop everywhere, right? And what do you, you know, what we want to do is run out there and grab towels or something, and then what does the patient do? They stand up and they slip in it. So we just, it's just this very intentional thought about, I've got to control my environment before I can move the patient. I need to control the patient, I'm sorry. Got to control the patient before I can control my environment. So I want to move the patient, but I have to make sure I have everything there. 
I, this is a mess. Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to stay by the patient and call for help. And then someone's going to bring me the things I need. So it's just a matter of kind of changing our mindset about that. Oh, here we go. This is more about altered elimination. We talked about all this. Um, yeah. Okay, and matching for dizziness or vertigo, we have them dangle their legs. I think people know this, 20 to 30 seconds. Non-skid slippers or even better would be appropriate footwear like tennis shoes that they would wear at home. We talked about PT. And you can see this theme. We're never going to leave these patients unattended. The idea is if they needed help to get to the commode or the bathroom, you've got to stay with them because there's nothing magical that happened in those two minutes that you just helped them up. They weren't getting any stronger. Let me say it that way. Um, okay, let's see. So these are things that we would consider if the patient is on benzodiazepines or other kinds of uh, medications that increase the risk of falls, these are things that we would do. Uh, we'll, we'll put the fall mat down, we'll do that toileting, we'll dangle. We keep reevaluating the need for that benzodiazepine. You know, some, some things, and especially as we move more and more toward order sets in the medical center, it's not necessarily that individual practitioner thinking about each patient, right? They come kind of as a, a set of orders, and they might not be appropriate for your older patients. Okay, and if they're weak enough, I think if they're weak, we talked about all of these things. Another thing is that we want to use our lift, um, our lifts, if we have ceiling lifts in the room, to mobilize these patients uh, if for a variety of reasons. It's good for their skin that you're not, you know, boosting them up um, on the sheets. It's important for your own ergonomics that we use these lifts if they're weak. So if there's any... So I think the take home from all of that is that these interventions, this is why the bundle approaches is, is probably the best way to think about it. And what, what's in the bundle? If I have a patient who's at a fall, high fall risk, the things I'm thinking about are bed alarm, fall mat, attended toileting, hourly rounding. It, in some ways, that hits the major um, factors like confusion, weakness, right? So you'll see kind of the same interventions over and over again. This is where I was going to tell you about our study. So this was another one of our slogans that we thought was so cute. It takes two to toilet. Um, there, were, there was one of our units that was having a, a hard time with falls in a population that they didn't think would be that challenging. So they went back and, and did the analysis of what, what was precipitating the falls. They found out 66% of them were related to toileting. One of the articles I read in preparation for this talk was said 70% of falls related to toileting. It really depends on where you are, how high that is, and where is about the worst place in terms of injury that you can fall, the bathroom. I mean, there is just nothing good about a fall in the bathroom where there's this plumbing behind us. We've had, you know, people, they get stuck in front of the bathroom door and you can't get it open. It's just bad. So this, this is why this attended toileting is so important. And it's a hard sell for nurses, and it's a hard sell for patients. So it's just like we all have to kind of keep working together, but it is the one thing that, that can make a significant difference. When they did the studies about hourly rounding, and I'm wonder, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the concepts of hourly rounding, but we check for things like pain, positioning. And they call it potty, which is kind of offensive. Let's call it toileting. But they call it the four P's, the pain, potty, positioning, and personal possessions. We've had people who have stood up and fallen because they were on their way to get their cell phone. Because a, someone comes into the room and they don't move the bedside table back to where the patient needs it. Or they have to get up to get something. This hourly rounding in this one study was shown to decrease the fall rate by 50%. Part of it was because they were toileting these patients. They were actively going in and asking them, you know, do you need to use the bathroom? And part of it was because they were assessing other things that might m make a patient um, do something that's unsafe, like needing to go get your water bottle or whatever. Oh, I know I have more. Oh, here we go. Here's another couple of cute slogans that we had. If you wake them, take them. We think about this now. We have a page, because we saw a lot of this, an incident report where a nurse would say, 
I was just in the room. I was in the room five minutes, and the next thing I hear, there's a crash. This is a very common scenario. A lot of it happens in the middle of the night. Why? They go in to do care for a patient. The patient's wake awakened, and um, then they walk out of the room. And now what do you have to do? If you're in asleep at home and the dog wakes you up or something, what's the, what do you have to do? You have to get up and go to the bathroom. And how excited are you about that prospect? You're not because your bed's warm, you're tired, you want to stay in your cozy bed. Same with our patients. If we go in there and we take vital signs, even if I say, do you need to use the bathroom? I have the time. They're going to be like, no, no, right? They want to just stay in their bed. So we actually came up with a strategy where it's like, no, if you wake them up, you need to take them to the bathroom. If you wake them, take them. And that actually cut down on the falls on this one unit. We talked about that time toileting already. And I, I said this, but this was our slogan, assist in, assist out. If you need to help someone to the commode or the toilet, you need to stay with them and get them back to bed. So what else do we know about just fall uh, prevention and what might work in the community setting and also in the hospitalized patients? Well, we know that a vitamin D deficiency increases the risk for falls. Really interesting. One study that I found here that I've quoted here, a high-dose supplemental vitamin D reduced fall risk by 19%, and this was across studies, um, and from seven, oh, from seven trials. And if they could achieve the serum, a high enough serum vitamin D concentration, it resulted in a 23% fall re reduction. So if I just give you supplements, I'll get some benefit from that. But if I give you enough supplementation to achieve this serum of 25, whatever that was, whatever the units are, um, then I can decrease your risk by 23%. Now we're just starting to really think about this at our medical center about, you know, so does, does that mean if we have a high risk patient we should be checking their vitamin D level and potentially supplementing them? Yeah, it seems like a pretty good idea based on this. What else? Well, last year I did a, uh, a study, well not a study, I reviewed a bunch of studies on Tai Chi and looking at fall risk. Um, it turns out that physical activity and exercise does reduce the risk of falls. In Tai Chi, some of the evidence has been mixed, but uh, what, they, what this meta-analysis said is despite evidence demonstrating beneficial influence on the known risk factors, the evidence indicating an actual impact on falls-related outcomes is equivocal. Um, and more large-scale longitudinal studies with consistent intervention parameters and clinically meaningful outcome variables are needed to clarify whether Tai Chi really works. One of the things that makes studying falls difficult is that it's a relatively rare event. When you think about, um, in terms of getting enough data to have the power to actually say something with statistical significance. So sometimes we study things that are proxy of fall or that we know would lead to fall because actually waiting around until you have enough fallers uh, can take a long time. So I'm about ready to just kind of wrap up and hear what your thoughts and uh, questions are. And here's just some of the pearls that I'm hoping that you'll take away from this. So it's really important that no matter what your setting, your care setting is, that you're focused on your population. Um, and you know, what, we've, we've had coaching before in our medical center about you want to use this idea of relate, don't compare. So when you hear me talking about the inpatient setting rather than, our, sometimes our first response is that she's not talking about my people or she's not talking about me. But what we really want you to do is to relate. So how does what we've talked about tonight, how, how might that make a difference in the populations that you're taking care of? How could you translate that into the care that you're delivering, whether you're community-based um, or hospital-based? We know we need to build safety into the environment. I have tried every way to modify patients, but it turns out it's very difficult to modify the patient. Therefore, we must modify the environment. And that's where we talked about fall mats. We did some uh, initial work looking at um, cushioned flooring in the rooms. The problem was that the, the more cushy the, the floor, the harder it is to move equipment across it. So we had to balance ergonomic risk of our staff against the safety of patients. But there's been work looking at the surface. And uh, you know, if you're more likely, you're less likely to fall in a carpeted 
environment or to sustain injury in a carpet environment than a vinyl environment. But you've got to balance that against all the infection control. So I'm saying you have to look at the environment and make it as safe as possible. We did put corner guards up in our room just like you would kind of do for even a toddler, thinking about making it as safe as possible. And then using your clinical judgment along with the scale to determine the risk. So those scales, like I said, those are um, sensitivity and specificity is in the 70 to 80 percent range, which means they're missing a pretty good group of patients uh, who might be at risk for fall. And so we always talk to our staff about, you know, even if they're not scoring in by one of your risk assessments, if they look like a faller to you, you need to just throw the book at them. When I say throw the book, I'm talking about a bed alarm, fall mats, attended in time toileting, things like that. Gate belts for all these patients. Okay, and that's my contact information, but I'm hoping that you'll talk to me now. So, Barb's going to... Yeah, we do have one question already. It says, by increasing vitamin D, does that treat an underlying depression that could contribute to an increase in fall? That's a great question, right? So maybe maybe this depression is the, is the mediator, right? And, and we're, there's something about that. I don't think that the studies were designed to look at that, but that's a great question. And actually, hey could be a good nursing study, right? If you looked at your patients um, that were receiving vitamin D supplementation and some kind of depression scale, they make me say this now at the School of Nursing. That could be a good study. I think that's um, actually a really interesting question because what is the mechanism um, of action for vitamin D? And I, from my reading, I don't know that it's very well understood at this point. That's a great question. Oh. Well, I, so what are hip protectors? I wish I had them on right now. They are like, uh, you know, they're like football pads that a, that a player would wear, only they, they're kind of like in a girdle type of uh, garment, and they have padding on each of the trochanter, on each of the hips. They have been shown in the evidence to reduce the risk of hip fracture. The problem is they are just not well tolerated by people because, and I can understand it, you're going to put a two two more inches on each of my hips? No, thank you. So I think, you know, there's a, and there's a problem with just people, with the acceptability. But if you can get your patients to wear them, they can be helpful. Fred's a uh, couple of questions, actually, about um, abbreviations. What mm -hmm. is TJC and what are SCD? Thank you, and sorry for using them. <laughs> TJC is the Joint Commission. That's what they changed their name from JCO, right? Um, to the Joint Commission, TJC, and SCDs are sequential compression devices. We call them leg squeezers to our patients, and they're um, to prevent a, a clot from forming after surgery or when someone's had prolonged immobility, so they sequentially compress the leg. But the thing about them, they wrap around the calf, and they're, they have a hose that's kind of um, connected to the machine. So if you try to get out of bed really fast, you are falling flat on your face because you are literally tethered. Sorry, I keep hitting the mic. Sorry about that. You are literally tethered to the, to the bed by those. And we also talked in our, our group this week about it's not really enough to just unhook them from the machine when you're ambulating a patient because then you have this flopping tube that can actually trip the patient. So one of our strategies was saying, no, if we need to ambulate the patient, the SCD needs to come all the way off and then reapplied. Um, afterwards, which is also good for patient skin. Who do you oh. have on your team when you're looking at fall prevention for a facility? And they're not feeling like you're mic'd, Barb. I'm getting, I see, we can't hear her. Um, I'm sorry, will you ask that one one more time? Yeah. Um, who do you have on your team when you're looking at fall prevention for a facility? Great idea. Great question. We have everybody. We have, um, and actually, this is a great, that's a great question because we've learned over the years. I think Back to my um, discussion about this being a nursing sensitive quality indicator, one of the downfalls of categorizing it like that is you really think that it must be a nursing solution. And it turns out so many people touch the patient. So we have physical therapists, occupational therapists, pharmacy. We have our um, uh, patient care technicians, which are like hospital assistants. They do a little bit more than that. You know, any, any kind of anyone we can think of, respiratory therapy. Because our idea is that we want to deputize the whole medical center to be on the fall prevention team. We want anyone that goes into that room to be have the um, backing to 
have the knowledge to understand if there's a risk and then have the backing to make a difference and change something in the room. So yeah, it's very broad group. Um, what is the source on the slide that takes two to toilet? I think that that is Cindy Sayer. <laughs> and that is Cindy Sayer and clip art circa 2004 or something. Yeah, so it takes two to toilet. We, we were just trying to think of kind of catchy slogans that we could um, communicate to our staff with that being about really assisted toileting. Somebody's typing. Oh, Alzheimer's Resource Agency. Oh. Well, I'll wait one more minute and see. I can see people are typing, but maybe it's not to me. I won't take it personally. Yeah. Yeah, there was a question actually before in early oh. in your um, lecture about objective measures, but I guess I thought you kind of covered that later on. Which objective measures of fall falls, risk. fall risk. Yes. Well, the objective measure of fall risk that I'm most interested in is, is grip strength, hand grip strength. And if you can't sleep one night, you can email me and I'll send you the lit review I did on grip strength, where you'll see that it is it actually does serve as a pretty good proxy to overall body strength. But we don't really use objective measures. A lot of it is subjective. Um, some of our confused patients have gotten up in a jerry pick chair mm. and slipped out under the tray. Any suggestions? Um, so that they, yeah. Well, it seems like we have. Um, devices like a wrap around product that would kind of secure around the chair to keep them up so that they, they can't slip underneath. Um, so I, I think that is a really very scary, I mean, suggestion would be, yeah, can you move them into the hallway near, near the nurse's station while they eat so that they could be under some surveillance? There's been a lot of work about beds and making sure that your beds, hospital beds, have the right um, height in terms of the, the bed mattress and the rail and there's actually tools that you can use to see if people can get out because nationally there have been strangulation deaths reported and I can just see that would be bad and that jerry chair. So some, some way to get more eyes on the patient is helpful and sometimes when we do have these patients that are confused and they want, they actually want to be where there's more activity. You'll see them on the neuro unit sometimes and they have them kind of in the chair and they have this wraparound Velcro belt to kind of keep them stabilized, but they're also getting interaction with the people that are walking nearby and, and the, you can quickly, lots of people would see if they were going to try to stand up or do something unsafe. So um, if you can't modify that jerry chair, I think trying to figure out a way to keep the patient in it and getting them to where there's more eyes on the patient would be good. In uh, falls resulting in a hip fracture, is there ever any evidence that the fracture happened before the fall? So a great question about, you know, when they have a hip fracture, did, did it happen before or after? And I, I think you really can never know. And the sad truth, I mean, generally I think we just take credit for that type of fracture. Um, I know with some of the medications that hip fractures are, are increased risk, but you just can't. It's very hard to determine what came first. They are able to for sometimes for subdural hematomas, and we have had a couple where the but it gets to the level of being the pathologist, unfortunately, um, on an autopsy can see that the person had some kind of event prior to the fall. But it, I think it's difficult with those long bone fractures. I don't know, Johnny. Yeah. yeah. In your research, have you looked at how long it takes or delays in the time it takes for staff to respond to toileting requests? So in um, looking at the question being looking at how long does it take for patient for providers to respond, we have a, a pretty fancy call light system at UWMC, and our average, you know, times of response are two to four minutes. But I, I don't think that really tells the whole story because that could be the front secretary saying, "Can I help you?" That could be somebody who's not really equipped to assist the patient running in, turning off the light. 
Um, so I don't think we've done a good study, and here's another good nursing study that we could do to really look at the response time to get the patient need met. It's very different than when the light gets turned off. So I think that, that is a really a good question, and I have not seen specific data on that. Um, so they're still saying they can't hear me. I'm not sure okay. what the problem is, um, but maybe you can repeat the question yeah. for those who can't. Um, do you have algorithms for identifying fall risk, and do you think the CDC study is usable? I'll have to say I'm not familiar with the STEADY tool, so I'll have to defer that one. Uh, our algorithms are around, uh, built around the fall risk assessment, the Johns Hopkins score, where anything six and greater is thought to be a high risk. Now we had, you know, this is another one of those conversations that we had where, so basically you have patients that are at universal precautions, meaning everyone in our medical center needs bed in the lowest position, um, clear path to the bathroom, right? Everybody in the medical center needs these universal fall precautions. When they cross the threshold of six on the Johns Hopkins score, this is where we start individualizing the interventions a little bit more and putting more aggressive interventions in place, like the fall mat, like the bed alarm, like a chair alarm. Um, so we really have, it's right now the way it is, it's, it's a binary, it's on or off. Uh, either you're at universal risk, like everyone, or you're at a high risk. And again, back to that discussion that we had last week, well, maybe we need a third category where the person's at high risk to fall, high risk of injury. But then somebody at the table asks, well, when you stratify that, what else will you do? At some point, you've put your whole bundle of interventions in place. So this is, you know, it's just kind of part of the ongoing dialogue that we're having. Is that good? I'm so, it was just really uh, great to be able to talk to everyone tonight. You have my contact information. I'm happy to answer questions if you have any. And I just wish all of you the best of success in this fall prevention. And also, if you have things to share with me, like, hey, you, we got our fall rate to zero, you should email me immediately. Because um, I also am open. I'm a fellow learner on the journey and really open to any suggestions you have. So I wish you all good night. Thank you. Okay. Oh, she's telling me to get low beds.